from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So I'm so glad to be here today on this rainy day to celebrate a spectacular voice in teen literature, Saba Tahir. <laughs> This is actually great because after every sentence, everybody applauds. <laughs> um, Saba is also a former Washington Post editor, and in her job at the Post, she says she learned much about the high stakes politics around the world that surfaces in her fantasy novels. Saba grew up in the Mojave Desert, and her parents are both immigrants from Pakistan. This has also led her to be an advocate for diverse voices in young people's literature, and we thank her for her advocacy. Sabah's first novel, An Ember in the Ashes, was an immediate best-selling success. The novel's setting, inspired by ancient Rome, an intricate plot grabbed readers around the world. We closed that book wondering what would happen to the slave girl, Laia, and the young soldier, Elias. The next book in the Ember series came out last year. Critics praised A Torch Against the Night as compelling and complex. Sabah's many readers can hardly wait for the third book, A Reaper at the Gate. It comes out this spring. We are lucky to have Sabah to hear as both an author and an advocate today. She'll be signing her books from noon to 1 p.m. And please join me in welcoming Saba. Wow, I was nervous, but I'm not nervous anymore. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being here today. I'm really happy to, um, hold on, sorry. Clicker. Um, I'm really happy to, uh, to be in DC and to talk about myself for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, now I'll talk about my books too, and also my childhood. Um, I'm not that selfish. Um, so I'm gonna, sorry, okay, yes. So I'm gonna talk about something um, very near and dear to my heart today. Um, it's one, been one of my constant companions since I was a young Ba uh, who first entered school long ago. I'm gonna talk about my old friend, failure. So I started failing young. Um, I still remember my very first instance of failure. This is me. Um, and speaking of failure, um, and this is a little off topic, but let's talk about the haircut. <laughs> um, I feel like Every South Asian mom in the world has given their daughter this haircut at some point. And I think they all get together in a room and they're drinking chai and they're like, what can we do to make sure that our daughters have like no self-esteem so they never talk to a boy ever? <laughs> I know, let's give them like 16th century page boy haircut when they're five or six, that'll do it. It worked, by the way, thanks mom. Anyway, um, I was in first grade and I got a D on a spelling test. My parents lost it, okay. Pandemonium. Um, I mean, like a child of my father's, um, getting, getting a D, it did not matter that I was six. Um, this was like the shame of the household. Um, I was busted and I got this big speech from my parents had to, about how I had to work twice as hard. Um, and I mean, I, every, I got put on lockdown, right? No Barbies. No play dates, no super soakers with my bro in the hot desert sun. Um, it was like spelling morning, noon, and night. No roller skates. Like they were just like, no, you can't do any of that. Um, so it was spelling morning, noon, and night until I was a master at it. And I remember sulking in the room that I shared with my mom and my dad and wondering, like, what is the big deal? Even as a six year old, I knew I was a six year old. <laughs> and I was like, this is not the end of the world, guys. Um, but my parents didn't see it that way. They didn't want the taint of failure in the house. Um, so very young, I learned not just to hate failure, uh, but to fear it. 
Fearing it, uh, sadly, did not stop it from happening. Um, sometimes I think the more afraid that you are of something, the more likely it is to like come knocking at your door. Um, it's sort of like when I was allergic to my brother's cat, it would always come and sit on me. Like it knew, it, it hated everyone else, but like it knew I was allergic to it, so it would come and sit in my lap. Um, I failed at many more spelling tests. Um, and math, God, math. Um, this is me in math. Um, <laughs> And that's not, not an exaggeration. Um, just out of curiosity, how many, how many of you guys like enjoy math? Like, how many of you are math people? I don't understand you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, you know, I just never gonna get it. Anyway, um, as I got older, I started fearing failure um, as much as my parents did because the cost was higher. Um, if I failed a test in high school, it affected my grades, and it, that affected my chance of getting into college. Um, and I lived in this really small town, and I wanted <clears throat> nothing more than to leave. So I got to the, to the point where one failure at one thing would sort of send me into a spiral of doubt. Um, if I failed at a test, if I you know, let a friend down, if I screwed something up, if I was late to something, um, I would kind of get worked into a frenzy. Um, and at this point, I wasn't learning from my failures. I just wanted to avoid them. Um, and I, didn't, I never examined my failures. I didn't forgive myself for them. I just got really, really angry at myself. Um, and I, I, I hated myself, and my self-esteem just tanked. Some of these, by the way, like kind of don't relate to what I'm saying. I just thought they were funny, so <laughs> this is one of them. I'm like, oh, it's Calvin and Hobbes. I'll put that up. That'll be great. Um, so I did. I personified failure in my head. Um, it became a capital F, um, and I could hear her. She was like a person. I could hear her murmuring in my ear, and she was telling me how much I sucked and how bad I was at everything. I'm going to explain this in just a second. So this whole thing continued until college um, and through my very, very first summer internship, which was at the Washington Post. I was 21 years old and I went into it like really excited and I failed so much that summer. It was spectacular. Um, I was a copy editor, so I was supposed to write headlines on the international desk and um, I screwed them up all the time. Um, I insulted reporters accidentally. Um, I flouted like Washington Post grammar style. I remember one time there was a reporter who was like a real big shot and he was calling from Iraq and he was like filing from the back of a truck and I hung up on him on accident. <laughs> and like, he couldn't get back on the sat phone to call us and I was like, blah. Um, and I think my finest moment was actually when I spelled Columbia the country as Columbia the university. Um, and it was in a headline on the front page. Um, but thank God there was a proofer who saved me from that particular humiliation. Um, and I didn't have like one of those really <laughs> like fluffy, like sweet, nice bosses who was like, let me guide you through your first internship. No, 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 no. He, he was like a hard ass and he was going to make sure that I but also everyone in the immediate vicinity knew when I had failed. He had a very penetrating voice. So failure, like usual, started talking to me again and telling me how terrible I was. And again, my self-esteem took this real hit. I would call my mom every day that summer, and I would wail to her about how I didn't belong at the Washington Post. And she would listen to me, and she would like pet me you know, over the phone and be like, it's going to be OK, it's going to be OK, pull it together. Right? Um, so I started realizing really quickly that if I wanted to continue to work at the finest news organization in the world, I did not have time to listen to that voice inside my head telling me that I was the worst. I did not have um, time to give it any attention because I didn't want to be thrown out onto the street outside the Washington Post. Like I couldn't sit there and, and wallow in how much I sucked, frankly. Um, so I was going to have to learn from my failure, but not just learn from it, I was going to have to get very comfortable with failure because I would be failing again and again and again, and I could not let that voice cripple, my, uh, cripple me and leave me in a spiral of doubt. I couldn't, I couldn't let that voice take over. So I started the very, very, very uncomfortable process of starting to think about why I had failed. Um, it was the only way to survive. Um, so when I messed up a headline, I started writing down what was wrong with it. Um, and when I took on too much and got yelled at for not turning it in on time, I started writing down, don't take on too much. Um, and slowly, failure became not an enemy, uh, but a teacher. And it was one of the longest summers of my life. <laughs> um, when I got to the end, I was pretty sure that my boss would either completely ignore me and be like, please leave. <laughs> Um, or that he um, would just walk over and say, you know, 
it was interesting having you here, and um, good luck in your career as something else. Um, but instead, something very strange happened. Um, I sat in the newsroom, I was kind of in the center of the newsroom, and there were all these reporters and editors around, and some of them were these huge names, and they had won Pulitzer Prizes, and they had had like movies based off their books, and um, a few of them started coming over, and they were like, hey, you know, you did a really good job. And I was like, were you, are you talking about the same person? Do I have a twin in the room who's very, knows what she's doing? Um, but they were like, no, 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 we, we heard. You know, we saw, <laughs> but, but you learned, and you got better. Um, and then Lo, my boss, comes over and tells me that he would love for me to apply for another internship the next year because he wanted me to come back so that he could work with me again and hopefully hire me one day. And that was the first time in my life that I had failed so miserably, and I did not hate myself for it, which was good, because a few years later, I would fail spectacularly again, and I would need to remember that lesson. So fast forward to 2007. Um, through the very, very cunning use of the dark arts, um, I have procured a job at the Washington Post. Um, no, I'm kidding, I didn't use dark arts, I just bribed them with chocolate, lots of it. Um, but I had been you know, working this night job as a copy editor, and I'd been reading all sorts of stories about child soldiers and genocide and terrible things happening in the world, and I read this one. Um, and this is a story by Emily Wax, who is still a reporter at the Post. Um, and, uh, and it is about women in Kashmir and how their families, um, uh, their brothers, fathers, sons were taken by the local military and thrown into prison and sometimes they were given no reason why, they couldn't get their family members out and they were kind of stuck living in this like half world while that was happening. And I remember this story haunted me um, because I have brothers and I was like, what if that happened to them? This is not out of the realm of possibility. You know, what if I lived in that place and it couldn't get this story out of my head. So. I kind of put together all these news pieces that I had been reading and I started getting an idea for a fiction book. Um, and all I had of this was this girl and her brother and a djinn um, who was bent on revenge and I got the djinn idea from the stories my mom told me as a little girl to scare the daylights out of me. Um, and I started working on it. Um, not because I think anything is gonna come of it but because it's like a bee in my bonnet. I just can't get it out of my head. So this is one of those ones that's not related, but I just put it up there. Um, so for months, I would work on this story at night, um, during the day. I'd work on it when I was supposed to be sleeping. I would work on it when I was supposed to be cleaning, um, when I was supposed to be hanging out with family. Um, it was my obsession. Um, and I, as I poured out words, I wrote one draft, and it was re like really bad. Um, and then after two years, um, I decided to quit my job. I'd had a child. I was going to stay home with him, and I was going to write. Um, in whatever time that I could get. So I did that, um, and by 2010, I had been working on the book for about three and a half years, and I had a draft that I was really excited about. So at the time, I had like three readers, um, and two of them, I sent it to them, and they read it, and they gave me some notes, and they generally liked it, and I was like, this is great, like I can go see if I can find an agent, it's gonna be wonderful. Uh. Um, then I gave it to my third reader, um, and I was really nervous about his comments. Um, and he came back, and his comments were extensive. Um, and something about it annoyed me, because I did not have a thick skin, um, and I felt like he didn't get it. I was like, you don't get the book, you don't, you don't understand. Um, and we argued about this, because he has strong feelings too, um, and he said that I was dismissing his advice, and I was like, no, you're an idiot. Um, and at the end of this argument, he said, your book is an unmitigated disaster. Yeah, right? That was not a good feeling. Um, this is not me, but it is very close to what, to what I look like after that. So I did not know how to respond um, because he really believed it. And the thing is, is, I really believed him. I really respected his opinion. Um, he was an extensive reader. He was a great writer, and I was totally crushed. So I had failed. I had, like, really failed. I had spent three years on something. Um, I had poured my soul into it, and it had just failed so badly, um, and I didn't know what to do. I thought, you know, I need to shelve this book. I need to put it away. I can't, I can't work on it anymore. Um, so I went through what my dear friend um, Liz calls um, a dark night of the creative soul. Um, I was pretty certain I was done, 
Um, I didn't want to write again. I didn't want to write anything else. This was the story, and if I couldn't do it, I wasn't interested. I got really down, guys. Um, I'll be real. I was watching like reruns of the Shawshank Redemption on TNT, and I was eating Ben and Jerry's straight out of the, the carton. Um, it was it was bad. Um, but but I started looking at the notes. Eventually, like my stubbornness like rose to the surface, right? Um, and I started looking at the notes that this guy had given me, um, and I started trying to figure out like why why is it an unmitigated disaster? <laughs> Um, and there was, a, there was a pattern. There was sort of a method to what seemed like chaos um, within what he was saying. And I was like, oh, I, I think he had a point. No, I'm going to have to say sorry. Oh, worse. Um, so it turns out, though, that in those three years of writing and rewriting and rewriting, I had actually learned something. Um, and I realized that I had failed in character arcs, and I had failed in world building. And I, there were a lot of mistakes. But my old friend, Failure, she was murmuring in my ear again. But this time, she was telling me what to fix. She was telling me how to fix it. She was saying, you have done this before, and you can do this again. And so that was not the last time I failed. That draft was better. It was better, but it wasn't the final. Um, uh, the final took two and a half more years before it was even ready for me to send it to an agent. Um, <laughs> and another year after that, it was print ready. So from the day I thought of the idea to the day that it was on the shelves was seven years and 10 months, and it felt like 84 years. It felt like forever. Um, and it, was, it just felt like an eternity. So, you know, life is it's full of failure. If you're a writer, a student, a doctor, a truck driver, a parent, a child, it doesn't matter um, what you do. You are going to fail. Um, it's this uncomfortable feeling at its, at its best, and it is miserable uh, at its worst. But I started to realize that failure is not just something that I have to get past or something I have to survive. It's something that I have to see as essential, um, if sometimes an unpleasant part of my life. It's sort of like like exercising um, or like having Thanksgiving dinner with relatives who you're like, no, um, let's not talk about politics. Um, so I think, no, okay, well, it's supposed to go back to the beginning, but it didn't, no worries. Um, my, I'm gonna talk about my most recent uh, uh, experience with failure to sort of wrap this up. Um, and it was very recent, it was this year. Um, I failed at writing my third book. I failed at it for months and months and months and months. Um, I was too distracted by the political situation going on. Um, I couldn't get into the story. I wrote a full draft. It was a nightmare. Like, if any of you guys saw it, you'd be like, ah! Um, it was so bad. Um, and then I rewrote it, and I rewrote it, and actually, two nights ago, at 11.59 p.m. on the day it was due, I turned in my third book. Um, um, but every moment until the moment that my husband, who was sitting across from me, was like, oh my god, it's 11.59, turn it in, like, send, the, send it now. Um, every moment felt like a failure. Um, failure is your teacher, it is your tool, it is your fuel, and it is your friend. It does not teach you what you've done wrong, it teaches you what you've done right. Failure will remind you of your weaknesses, absolutely, but it will also remind you of your strengths. Um, and I think most importantly, it reminds you um, about who you are, um, about what you're made of, and about how far you have come. So if you have questions, particularly about failure, please come and ask them. That's it. Any questions? No questions? No one? Oh, I see questions. Okay, yes, come, please come to the mic. Hi, first of all, I'd just like to thank you so much for being here, and just, I love your book so much, and I love that um, you're a Pac City writer, and just that you, and it just means so much to me because I've wanted to be a writer for so long, and just, um, I, I haven't seen myself in, in that space. I'm part of so many writing spaces, and the fact, bringing diversity to writing spaces is a very cause near and dear to my heart, and I just wanted to thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, I appreciate that. My question is, um, could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges you faced when um, in, in world building? Because when it comes to my writing, I like uh, fantasy is one of my favorite things. But one of the challenges I come across is trying to know um, how much information needs to be relayed to the reader. Like how much I need to know how much needs to be relayed to the reader when it comes to world building. So how do you balance that? And um, just what are some of the challenges you face? 
So I don't think there's like a hard, it's a great question. Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, but I sort of follow this thing called the iceberg rule, which is like, I don't actually know any numbers, so if I get this wrong, apologies, but it's like 70% of the iceberg is under the water or something like that. So it's sort of like that with world building, where 70% of my world building is just in my head, and, the th and then 30% is what I show on the page. Um, and then in terms of how to world build, um, I would say I generally tend to start with my characters and build out from there. Um, the other thing is I write in iteration. So I don't try to have my world perfect the first time. I build the world as I edit, and I add in different ideas and, and you know, if it's, whether it's architecture or art or, um, you know, the military and how it's designed, whatever that is, it's, it, it goes through in iterations. And then once you, if you're doing fantasy, you might be doing a series. Once you sort of start your series, um, you will see that it gets easier as you go along because you've, you've built the world already. Um, the rest of the writing still sucks, by the way, but the world building is a little bit easier. So, um, so yeah, I would say try not to put quite as much up front and let it kind of emerge as you, as you write the book. You can always add world building if someone's like, I don't understand this, but it's a little harder to kind of like take it out once you've already put it in. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, why don't we go to this side? Hi. Hello. Um, so I was wondering if you had any insights about, I think usually failure is thought of as being something external, you know, that you're disappointing other people's expectations. How have you found a way to get past failure in your own mind before it's even happened? Because for me, as a writer, what's always been hardest is either as, you know, somebody who studied a lot of literature, thinking like, oh God, this isn't Jane Austen, so what's the point of even doing it? Or, um, you know, if you were a real writer, then you would be writing every spare minute that you possibly had, and you're not doing that. So clearly you're not cut out for this world. Just find a grown-up job. Have you had anything like that? I have, yes, I have. Um, I think that I experienced it very, I mean, I still experience it. I, I still, one of my friends, um, her name is Lee Bardugo, she said something sort of funny the other night. She said, every time an author opens a book, they look at the page and they go, wait, wait, how do I book again? <laughs> like, what, how do I do this? And it's very true. So first of all, know that you're not alone. But I would say be kind to yourself. Um, it is okay if you're a writer and you can't write all the time. Um, particularly if you're not, if you're not published yet. Um, it is very, very difficult to, I, I know very few people who are able to write full time if they're not published because they need a job <laughs> um, to pay the bills. <laughs> so. Um, I used to write in elbows of time, um, 15 minutes here, 20 minutes there, whatever I could do, um, and that really helped me. But in terms of sort of facing the failure in your own mind, um, really take it a day at a time. And when you do have successes, whatever they are, if you finish a paragraph and you like it, if you finish a chapter and you like it, celebrate that um, and remind yourself of it. And if it's something you've done that you're really proud of, stick it on your wall so that every time you hit that place where you're like, why am I doing this? You can look up and you can see it and you can remind yourself of, of why you're putting yourself through it. So I hope that helps. It does, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, on this side. Hi. Oh. Hi, nice to hear. Um, Hello. What characters, both ones you write and you don't write, can you relate to the most and which characters sort of inspire you? Um, I'm really inspired by the Commandant. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Um, she's evil, in case any of you were wondering. Um, um, I am inspired by, I love Hermione. She's one of my favorite characters. Um, I think Hermione has a wonderful um, sort of questing imagination, and I would really love it if she became real and could be my best friend. Um, and um, um, I'm trying to think of other characters. I, in my, in my own books, it's a little bit easier because I kind of draw most of them from me, but I probably relate the most to the, the main character of Elias. Um, he is sort of this like angsty, like morally tortured, <laughs> you know, person who's like feels like he doesn't fit in and, you know, always feels like he's kind of doing stuff wrong. And, um, you know, I, I can't relate to like the, the soldier side of him. Like he can fight and beat people up and stuff and I'm, that's not something I am skilled at, um, though I sometimes wish it was. Um, but, but I definitely relate to him. But in a sense, I relate to all my characters. They are little pieces of me. Um, I think that you have to, um, whether it's a hero or a villain or something in between, you kind of have to really understand your characters from their soul outward. Um, otherwise, they become caricatures and cut out. So even my, my villains, I definitely to some degree, I absolutely relate to them because in their minds, 
they're not villains. They're, they're just doing their thing. And if other people are getting in their way, you know? Um, so I think that, um, I think that in terms of, of who I relate to, all of them to some, to some degree. Um, but, but Hermione is definitely, definitely my favorite character. And Professor McGonagall, actually. Um, I, I always find a way to bring Harry Potter into my talks. I don't think I've had a single one in two years where Harry Potter hasn't shown up. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yes. First, I want to thank you because I think that you're a really good role model for aspiring writers because you're so transparent, especially on your Instagram about yes. your writing experience. <laughs> thank you. Um, my, someone from my um, publishing house was like, are you okay? Like, <laughs> are you going to finish the book or are you going to have a breakdown? I was like, I don't know. I'm not sure yet. Sorry, go on. <laughs> so leading off of that, I was wondering, you've spoken in the past about expanding the world and writing about other characters' experiences in it. Is that still something that you're thinking you'll do, maybe after you've taken a bit of a break? Yes. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi. My Hello. question is, aside from failure, were there any other factors that motivated you to write? Um, there were, yeah, failure was the main one, um, but um, my kids were, um, are probably one of my biggest motivations. They are two little brown boys, and I want them to see themselves in books. I want them to pick up a book and think that they can be the heroes of it, um, and that people who look like them can be the heroes of it. Um, that's why these new covers were so important to me. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, having... Um, having a brown girl on the front of a book um, and a, a Middle Eastern coded guy on the front of a book. You can't really see him as well in, in, in this cover, but particularly in the first cover, you can kind of see his face a little bit better. Um, it, was, it was very important to me. So that's, that's absolutely a motivating factor. Um, and then actually my stubbornness um, was very motivating. When I was a kid, my, my parents hated it. So I want to tell any small children in the audience, um, if you are stubborn and your parents give you grief, don't worry. It can be very helpful later in life. Um, so yeah, I just I was like, I have to write this story, and by God, I'm gonna do it. So, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hi. Hello. So I guess my question is, what was your favorite book growing up, and what's your favorite book now? Or have they changed, and has that influenced your writing at all? Um, that is an excellent question. It has influenced my writing. Um, my favorite book growing up was um, Seven Daughters and Seven Sons. Um, it was uh, about this Iraqi girl who um, is the youngest child in her family, or sorry, the middle child in her family, and kind of goes off to try to save them. And it was the first time I had seen a book with a person who looked like me, and she was not, you know, um, either a villain or a character who didn't have any like rights or you know a character who was sort of put down she was her own person she was fully formed and she was a badass um, so that was my favorite book as a kid um, as an adult uh, this is like a really really generic answer but the the Harry Potter books um, no one in the audience who knows me should be at all shocked about this um, I think that those books changed my life um, and I was 18 when I started reading them, and they're really what helped me believe that I could become a young adult author. Um, thanks, Joe Rowling. So, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. I was wondering how you juggle writing from multiple viewpoints. Um, okay, so there's a few different things that I do. Um, one thing is, is when I do the first draft, I don't try to make them sound different. I just write in one voice. I put their voices in as an edit. I call it a tonal edit. And so um, usually what I do is I go find um, music that inspires me and makes me think of each of these characters. Um, I watch uh, movies that like, you know, if I'm writing Elias, I'm gonna go watch like Apocalypse Now, right? Um, uh, and like, you know, war movies and stuff and, and movies about angsty boys. Um, and if I'm thinking about Laia, you know, I'm gonna listen to very specific kinds of music and that's gonna sort of get me into her head. Um, the other thing that I did to help me understand my characters better is I tried to find people in the real world who mirrored them. No, I have not found an Elias, sorry guys. Um, um, but I did find um, uh, a West Point cadet um, who I talked to about being in a military school. I interviewed him about that. Um, I talked to a police sergeant um, about uh, what it was like to you know, be a warrior, basically, to have the soul of a warrior. Um, I talked to a woman who 
um, was an FBI um, agent, and uh, she worked on a sp uh, special task force for gangs in San Jose. Um, and she was really fascinating because when I met her, it was like meeting an older version of Helene. Um, she had like, and I had already written Helene, but she had you know blonde hair and like ice blue eyes, and she was a total badass, and I would never ever mess with her. Um, but it was really fascinating to talk to her because she, in particular, in particular, helped me understand sort of this balance between when you have the soul of a warrior, but you have a family, and how it can tear it apart, um, and how you end up having to put one or the other first, and it's just a really difficult balance. So for me, research, like primary sources, like, you know, trying to figure out who these people are at their very core and writing from there as opposed to um, writing it and then sort of adding it in, that's, that's how I approached, you know, getting the, getting the different viewpoints, you know, right, I guess. Thank you so, so much. So you're welcome. Um, yes, hello. Hello, small one. Um, my question is, how do you write with children <laughs> I'm at home? Uh, and finding that time, that balance, and then keeping your mind on your book, keeping your mind sane with your children, um, how do you survive? <laughs> yes, that's an excellent question. Um, the thing is, is that it's a, it's a constant struggle. It's not something that I fully worked out yet. Um, and I'm just going to be real honest with you. Um, I do, like I said before, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, I write in elbows of time a lot of times. Um, where if I have 10 minutes, if I have five minutes, I will write whatever I can. Um, I'll try to keep my computer with me, I'll try to keep a notebook with me, and I'll just write. I, I can edit a page in you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, and somebody once gave me this interesting number. Um, she said, and I'm sure some like, famous white dude author has said this as well, but my, one of my friends said, if you write three pages a day, you have a book in a year. Um, and I think, I mean, that's, that's really true. So it's just about finding whatever time you can. That's what it was about for me, finding whatever time I could um, to get in whatever I could. And then the biggest thing is I had family support. So uh, my husband was incredibly supportive. I could not have written the first book without him, you know, helping me, helping me find time. And even now, um, the last two weeks, I was finishing my draft. Fail <laughs> I was failing at my draft. Um, and you know, I worked every night until one or two or sometimes three in the morning, so who's taking the kids to school at, you know, 7 a.m.? Who's getting them ready? Who's, you know, it's not me. <laughs> you know, so just having your family support and asking for help, too, I would say, is another thing that I really recommend. Um, when I was living in D.C., I asked my in-laws for help. They were very supportive. When I was, you know, now I'm out in, in California, and I asked my family and friends for help out there when I need it. Um, there's no shame in that. Um, you just you just gotta let them know you're following your dream. That's a that's a good cause, guys. So, you're welcome. Hello. So, um, hi. Um, uh, I found your books really inspiring, and for everyone, and especially young writers. And if you could say something to them right now, what would you say? I would tell young writers um, the three pieces of advice I usually share. Um, the first one is read a ton. Um, and not just what you want to write, read outside that. Read poetry, read the newspaper, read the Washington Post. <laughs> um, um, read nonfiction. Um, uh, read, if you really love mysteries, read romance novels. If you really love romance novels, read thrillers. Just r read outside what you normally read because that is going to be the thing that helps you the most. Um, the second thing is don't give up. Um, it took me, like I said, seven years and 10 months to see my book on shelves after the idea first germinated in my head. That is a long time. <laughs> it's a long time to be like, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. It, is, it, it, it sometimes takes forever, so definitely don't give up. Have, have faith in yourself. Um, and the last bit of advice is a little bit meaner, um, and that advice is don't, don't make excuses for yourself. Um, I made a lot of excuses for myself as a young writer. I was too busy. I had children. I, you know, had a life. I had an ill relative. I, you know, whatever it was. I wanted to see my friends. I had all these excuses that I had built up for myself. But in the end, that's all they were. Writers write. They find a way. Whether you're, you know, ill or well or old or young or, you know, in school or in prison, people find a way to do it. And I always come back to um, Paul Kalanithi, who wrote When Breath Becomes Air, when he had stage four lung cancer and was dying. Like, if he can do that, y'all can write a book. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, hello. 
one of the things that impressed me the most about your story was even though you developed an early fear of failure, you didn't take the easy way out and just and not try. But you, you kept on being persistent in spite of that. You didn't let the fear of failure stop you from trying. How is it that you developed that? Um, I, I have to give a lot of credit to my parents. Um, they, I had a tiger dad. Um, he was very much like, you know, you will be awesome or you will be nothing. Um, so <laughs> um, I think that, that my parents were a huge part of it. They really, really helped me understand that if I wanted to be anybody, I could not give up. Um, and then I do think that part of it was really a natural stubbornness. Um, I'm the youngest of three kids. I'm, you know, I have two older brothers who were typical older brothers um, and who definitely didn't let me get away with anything. Um, and I think that that, that also had a, a big part of it. And also there's this thing called self-talk. Um, apparently Navy SEALs do it, just saying. Um, but what you basically do is you keep telling yourself that you can do something, whatever it is, and you, re you keep reminding yourself of that in any way you can. And I found that really helpful. Uh, we've got about two minutes left, so maybe two more questions. Um, let's go to this side. Um, hi. hi. I wanted to know if it was hard to keep like a storyline going with different books, like and not not let it be repetitive. I guess. Um, it can be, yeah. But generally, I have I have the sort of the story of the characters plotted out in my head, like all the way until until death. Um, and so, um, so it's not as hard as I think it could have been had I not planned out the, the books ahead of time. That doesn't make them easier to write, by the way. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Would you ever consider writing a superhero novel? I know they're a big uh, trend in uh, YA literature lately. I would. <laughs> yeah, What I would. superhero would you want to Ms. Marvel. <laughs> I haven't thought about this at all. Um, not once, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Hi. Um, first, I just wanted to say that I really love your new covers because it's like one of the first times that I've seen myself on a cover as a brown girl. Yes. Thank you. I'm so glad you like them. I was wondering, how do you work to get over writer's block when you have it? Oh, I love this question. Um, because I didn't used to have an answer, and then one of my friends provided an answer, and I have since stole it from her. Um, so Alison Goodman, uh, who wrote the Aeon books and the Dark Days Club books, um, says that she doesn't believe in writer's block. She believes in writer's pause. Um, and that's what I've been sort of um, thinking about recently. It's, it's not that I'm blocked. It's that something has gone wrong in the past whatever, however many pages I've written, that has made me not know what to do next. And so what I do is I go back to the last place that the story has worked, and I start from there, and I try to start looking at, okay, this is where the story was flowing. What happened afterward that, that isn't working? Generally, it's something like, you know, um, my character's motivations aren't right, or the conflict doesn't quite fit. There's something off. So if you're struggling with writer's pause, um, go back to the last place that felt good, and start from there and start sort of going through. Um, and one more question and then we'll be done. <laughs> um, thank you for coming and joining us today. And my question is, where do you get your inspiration from? Um, so I get my inspiration almost primarily from news stories that I read. Um, and um, more recently, reading about the refugee crisis in Europe and the Middle East has been a huge inspiration for the stuff I've written. Um, it has found its way into Torch in particular, and it will be finding its way into Reaper. Um, so yeah, um, that's why I said, read the Washington Post. And with that, thank you guys very much for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.